with that, let me introduce you to our presenter. Chelsea McKinley is the Plant Health Specialist at the USBG. She manages the Integrative Pest Management Program, helping gardeners identify and solve plant health issues in our collections. Chelsea has worked at the garden since 2014 and previously worked as a gardener in the horticulture collections team caring for the medicinal and Mediterranean plant collections. Welcome, Chelsea. As Grace mentioned, I'm Chelsea McKinley. I'm the plant health specialist here at the United States Botanic Garden. I oversee um, everything related to integrated pest management at the United States Botanic Garden. So today I'm going to be talking to you all a little bit about how we go about managing the bugs at the Botanic Garden. And uh, bugs is in quotation marks because not everything, not all of, not everything we manage are considered bugs, right? So uh, bugs are a specific type of arthropod and we uh, control a variety of different arthropods. So for example, um, mites and thrips are not considered bugs, but aphids and mealybugs are considered bugs. So uh, I might be a little bit of a stickler when it comes to uh, scientific definitions, but I wanted to explain that um, I'm, I don't often use the term bugs because it's not like a broad encompassing term. So you might hear me use the word arthropods um, a little bit more or beneficials is kind of a catch-all term that I use to uh, describe the various organisms that we use to help control the pest issues at the Botanic Garden. And so moving on. I wanted to, for those of you who maybe aren't in the uh, plant health field or don't have a ton of experience with plant health, define for you what integrated pest management is. Uh, we, in this, we who work in this field use this term a lot and, you know, there's not one solid definition for what it is, but I found this really great um, definition on um, uh, university website I wanted to share with you all so you kind of had an idea of the purpose behind why we do things the way that we do at the Botanic Gardens in terms of integrated pest management. So integrated pest management or IPM is an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests and their damage through a combination of techniques such as biological control, habitat man manipulation, modification of cultural practices, and use of resistant varieties. Pesticides are used only after monitoring indicates that they are needed according to established guidelines, and treatments are made with the goal of removing only the target organism. Pest control materials are selected and applied in a manner that minimizes risks to human health, beneficial and non-target organisms, and the environment. So today I'm going to be telling you a lot about the biological controls that we use here at the Botanic Garden, because that's really been um, kind of the cornerstone of our IPM program. We do do some um, habitat manipulation and modification of cultural practices, but those would probably be uh, separate uh, PowerPoint presentations and, and uh, take a lot more of the time. So Today, uh, I'm gonna be focusing mostly on bio bio biological control, uh, which are things that we add into our uh, system, um, our cultural system of growing plants. And so here is kind of a behind the scenes look at what I do every week. Um, this is the only thing I do, but this is a big portion of what I do. And this is a spreadsheet that helps me organize what uh, beneficials or biological controls I am releasing in what areas throughout the garden. So if you're not familiar with the United States Botanic Garden, we have two facilities. We have the conservatory, uh, which is what um, CSV stands for. And then we have the production facility, which is offsite um, in Southwest DC. And the production facility is a very large uh, growing facility, lots of different greenhouses um, with different climates 
for the various crops um, that we grow as backup or to um, supplement our uh, conservatory space. And so the, this isn't meant for you to read everything that's on here, but just to kind of show you the scale of what it is that we do when it comes to biological controls. We are doing uh, weekly releases. So I get in a shipment of beneficials every week and uh, I kind of alternate between where I'm doing most of the releases. So, so one week I'll release at the conservatory and then the next week I'll release at the production facility and um, I'll be releasing throughout the week as well. So I'll get the shipment on Wednesdays, release a lot on Wednesdays, release some on Thursdays. Some I will hold until they begin to emerge from their eggs or pupil casings and then release them into the crop um, later in the week or the following week. And we've really increased what we've done in the past couple of years in terms of biological control. And this has resulted in a reduction of the number of synthetic um, persistent chemicals uh, and pesticides that we've had to use. Uh, it is a lot of work um, and we haven't been able to, we've, we've only been able to do this with the help of our volunteer corps, as well as a lot of teamwork when it comes to um, not just me releasing, but then also the gardeners um, helping with releases in their primary care areas. So you might be wondering, okay, you're releasing all these beneficials and all these biological controls and all these different areas. How do you know what to release where? Well, we do a lot of scouting, ton of scouting. Um, and with the scouting, we have sticky cards that we rely upon for our flying insects. And so these you can see um, have two, so this is one card and it's two different, it's yellow on one side and blue on the other side. The thought is that different insects are attracted to different colors. Um, there's kind of a lot of mixed science and opinions on that, but we figured, you know, have both to, to as kind of a catch all. And so for our flying insects, we're, we monitor our thrips populations, our whitefly populations, aphid populations, and then others as they appear. So sometimes we'll get leaf hoppers. And then sometimes, unfortunately, we also capture beneficials on these cards as well, but it helps show like which beneficials are present in the crops and are sticking around for a while after we release. So for the insects that are not flying, because not all of our pests uh, or arthropods fly, right? So mites don't fly. Mealybugs don't fly, scale don't scale doesn't fly. Um, so we do a lot of hands-on scouting in the crops. So that means we're looking at the plants, we're going through them, we're looking at the soil, we're looking at the stems, we're looking at the older growth, the newer growth, the undersides of the leaves, the top sides of the leaves. And sometimes we're also doing plant tapping, which involves taking the plant and holding it over a white piece of paper and then gently tapping. The new growth or the flowers on top of that white piece of paper and that that will dislodge a lot of the smaller insects that might be more difficult to find on a plant and allow us to see um, you know what comes off of that plant if we're getting a lot of thrips or mites things like that and the most important component of any sort of scouting program is uh, monitoring um, and um, and magnification. So <laughs> you definitely need a hand lens or a magnification visor or something like that to be able to see and identify some of these really, really tiny and small arthropods that might be feeding on your plants, right? Um, there are many things that I can't see with my naked eye, but once I see it under magnification, usually 10X is enough. Um, I'm able to distinguish between a thrips and a mite. And that di distinguish that distinguishing between those two is very important when it comes to how to treat them. Uh, it could, you know, there's different beneficials that work for different, um, different pests and there are different um, 
insecticides and miticides are completely different chemical classes. So if we did need to treat, it would be a completely different treatment. So getting into some of the nitty gritty of, okay, what, what are we exactly releasing? Um, and on my introductory slide, there was a picture of that I took of a predatory mite and uh, aphid mummy. And um, so predatory mites are definitely the workhorses of our integrated pest management and our biological control. There are seven different species of mites that we use. Um, it, <laughs> you know, most, most of the time when people think, oh, beneficial insects, biological control using insects or arthropods, they think, oh, lady beetles, praying mantises, you know, these highly visible uh, beneficials that we know eat other insects. And those are great in the landscape, but in reality, inside, in the greenhouses, predatory mites really do so much of the work because they're the ones crawling around eating the eggs and eating you know, sort of those first life stages that come out of insects' eggs, right? So if they're eating the eggs of the insects or arthropods that are feeding on our plants, then um, that means that they're, those insects aren't going to be able to hatch out of the eggs and feed on our plants. So they are very effective. Um, and the reason why we have seven, seven different species that we release is because different predatory mites will feed on different insects or arthropods. So, you know, we have uh, Stradiolalaps simitus. That's this top photo here. This is a soil dwelling mite, uh, even though this picture is it on a leaf. Um, it feeds on fungus gnats, shore flies, and thrips pupa. So it just kind of hangs out on the soil surface and crawls around, eats whatever it can find. In the middle, we have a uh, predatory mite, uh, Neocialis, Californicus. This predatory mite feeds on uh, various other uh, plant pest mites. And, um, you know, there, you might see on this list, like, okay, it seems like there are a few that feed on similar things, like Amblyseus swirsky and Amblyseus cucurimorus. They both feed on thrips, larvae, and pest mite species. Well, what's the difference? Well, just like with plants, different insects thrive in different environments. So, you know, Swirsky prefers warmer environments, whereas Cucurmorus can survive slightly cooler environments. So we have to somewhat tailor which beneficials we use depending on the environment at which, in which they're going to exist and in which the pest exists. So in addition to these seven species of mites, we also use 12 other species of insects and two species of nematodes, and approximately uh, four species of fungi, and two species of bacteria in our biological control program. So I have this fun video for you all. Uh, it's a great video to learn more about predatory mites, and then also their application in agriculture as well. Um, you know, I've, I've said that we, we buy these in, these are products that are available commercially. And, um, you know, we're not the only ones using these products. These are, these are common in the industry. And it's, the industry is kind of going this way for pest control because of issues with um, resistance to pesticides. <laughs> This mite is super small, roughly the size of a grain of salt. But its oversized appetite makes it one of the most daunting threats farmers face. Unchecked, they devastate crops like these delicious strawberries. You'll know these mites by their calling card, dry, rusty leaves. 
and by these messy webs that give our tiny foe its name, the two-spotted spider mite. It's not really a spider, but it is an arachnid, so it's related, and it does have two dark spots. It sucks the juices from the strawberry plant's leaves with its needle-like stylet. Sip after sip, row after row, pretty soon the leaves won't be able to absorb enough sunlight to fuel the plant. Farmers use pesticides, but spider mites quickly become resistant. So farmers formed a strategic alliance with a bolder batter mite, Persimilis. Persimilis is a predator. It only eats other mites, and its favorite is the two-spotted spider mite. The tiny carnivores arrive in bottles packed with vermiculite, a lightweight mineral that gives them something to hold on to. But spreading them by hand takes a ton of time. So some farmers are taking this old battle to the next level. They're calling in air support. Drones packed with persimilis. The predatory paratroopers rain down on the field below. The moment they land, the bright red persimilis start hunting down the unwelcome vegetarians. Persimilis are blind. They track down their prey with palps that sense vibrations and smells. Plants under attack by spider mites release pheromones. Those signals lead Persimilis right to their prey. They tear into their prey with biting pincers called chalicery and slurp out the innards. Persimilis have a taste for eggs too. Caviar, anyone? Mm. Eventually, this skilled hunter is so successful, it exhausts its only source of food. When the feasting's done, the Persimilis can't survive. The field goes quiet. The strawberries are safe, at least until the spider mites return to face another fight from the skies. Hey, it's Laura. You know who else has my... All right, so we don't use drones to release our predatory mites, but I do have a pretty cool blower that I will occasionally use. Uh, it kind of looks like a ray gun to some degree, and it has this funnel on top that I will pour uh, that release material in that you saw in that video. So it has vermiculite, sometimes it'll be bran, and I'll pour, pour it in there and it will feed into a blower that then uh, projects it into the crop. So I just kind of like blow the tree canopy and the crops in, in the garden court or down at the production facility. And it's an easy way to get these predatory mites up into the canopies, the top of the trees, since we have quite high canopies in some parts of the conservatory and it can be hard to get beneficials up there otherwise. Um, but yeah, so if you're ever at the conservatory and you see a bunch of like little dust or whatnot scattered around, that's what that is. It's the release material for our predatory mites. And so those releases are considered mass releases. And there are many more adults that are released at one time. It's a really great method if uh, prey are already at low to moderate numbers or there's hot spots around. The downside of mass releases is that this is something that has to happen more frequently, right? So in the presentation, in the video that we just watched, 
um, the uh, narrator was talking about how when they run out of food, their po the Persimilis population also declines. So if, say, the two-spotted spider mite population was to rebound, the Persimilis population would probably rebound as well, but it might be a little bit slower and maybe not at, not fast enough to prevent crop damage, which is why the grower would maybe then need to go in and re-release and do another release to prevent uh, crop damage. Another option to mass releases that we use at the conservatory and a lot at the production facility, more so at the production facility because uh, they can be a little bit of an eyesore depending on who's asking, <laughs> uh, are these uh, slow release sachets that are in this photo right here. So the, in these sachets, there is bran. On the bran in these sachets, there is a mold. There's also a mold mite that feeds on the mold. And then the predatory mite feeds on the mold mite. Mold mite. So it's a whole little ecosystem in this little sachet. The predatory mites are running around, laying eggs, eating mold mites. And then, you know, when they want to move out of their parents' house, they crawl out of a little hole on the sachet and crawl around the plant looking for better food, better place to live. And so these sachets are really great as a preventative method because it gives them it gives the predatory mites a place to live if say maybe there's not a lot of prey and it's a uh, slow release. So we typically will get anywhere between like 10 to a hundred mites emerging per day out of the sachet rather than say, we just dump a bunch of mites on the plant one day and do that once every two weeks. You know, there's, if, if there's a low number of mites or a low number of um, pests on the plant, then the slow release method will be more likely to control, you know, any sort of pests that happen to um, come onto these plants in between those times of mass release. And these sachets last about four to six weeks. So when they're done, sometimes I'll check just I'll open them up and check to see if I see any more predatory mites. Um, otherwise, we'll pull them and put out new sachets. So this can be a little time consuming, but it's also very effective at preventing any sort of pest um, or the target pest from occurring. So moving on to mealybug and scale control, you know, the predatory mites that we were talking about, they're really great for some of our smaller pests, um, some of our more soft body pests like thrips, uh, mites, white fly, um, you know, pre predatory mites are great, pretty good at controlling those various pests. But when it comes to mealybug and scale, it uh, they often require a different set of predators and a different type of biological control. So one of our primary methods for scale control is using Chrysophila, also known as lacewings. And these are insects that are present in the landscape. So they're outside. You can probably find them flying around your, um, your uh, porch light at night. And so this is the adult right here. And they get their name from their lacy wings. There are both brown lace wings and green lace wings. So you might see either one outside in the landscape. And this is what their um, larvae look like. So they're really mean looking larvae. They do bite. <laughs> I've learned the hard way. Uh, they have these sort of pinchers and um, the pinchers have venom in them and they don't like leave a bug bite or anything like that. It's just a little pinch. Um, but we buy them in on these cards that have their eggs glued to them. They also have um, unviable caterpillar eggs because these are very voracious eaters. So there's some food for them when they first hatch out for them to eat. Otherwise they will eat each other. Um, 
And so I wait until these start to hatch out and then I will put the cards out in the crop. And we use them a lot to target brown soft scale. So this is a picture of a brown soft scale over here on the right or wax scale. Um, sometimes we'll also use them for mealybug um, or other scale issues. But these crawlers, these um, larvae, the lacewing larvae will eat scale crawlers. So we use them to target scale. And there's a nice little video of um, their very unique method of egg laying. Was still do, though for them, it's an adhesive with a difference. This is a female. She is looking for a safe place to deposit her eggs. Silk will provide it, but not exactly in the way you might think. She will lay up to 300 eggs, almost twice her body weight. However, there are plenty of other insects around that will eat those eggs if they find them. So she doesn't glue them directly on the plant stem. First, she produces a little drop of sticky silk. And then, at the end of that, the egg. It's suspended safely in midair. The silk is produced by glands in her abdomen in liquid form. It's the very act of pulling it out that changes it from liquid to solid. And that is true for all invertebrate silk. She will lay up to 30 eggs a day each on its own stalk. That silken thread is so incredibly fine that insect predators like these ants walk right by the eggs without realizing that there's a tasty meal within millimeters of them. So despite regular ant patrols in search of food, the lacewing's eggs remain undiscovered. After three days, they begin to hatch. Now, at least if danger threatens, the offspring will be able to help themselves by running away. So this is a really great example of how uh, Mother Nature does things much better than we do. <laughs> uh, so we you know, it was showing how the ants weren't able to find the eggs because they're attached to thin, thin stalks. Unfortunately, we have a problem with ants in our conservatory because ants like to farm uh, soft honey dew producing insects. So they like to farm scales, they like to farm mealybugs, they like to farm aphids for their honeydew. Uh, they also like to eat the eggs the lacewing eggs off of the cards that I put out, uh, which is why uh, I hold the cards until the lacewings have already started emerging and then I put them out in the crop to give the lacewings a chance. But it would be nice if the eggs were on the on little stocks, but I don't think that'd be possible for shipping. Um, but you, I've, I've found these sort of stocks and eggs uh, both in the greenhouses and outside the landscape, uh, both at the conservatory and at home. So if you're scouting your plants out in the landscape, you might see uh, these magical little stalks with eggs on them. And now you know that they are lacewing eggs. All right, so getting to mealybugs more specifically, we release Cryptolamus, which is also known as mealybug destroyer. This is a great little lady beetle of sorts. Uh, it's a little bit smaller than your typical um, Asian lady beetle, and it uh, has black wings and a red head with black eyes. And we get them in these fun little like Parmesan cheese shakers. And I release the adults in the crops. And if we're lucky, the adults lay eggs and we get the larva. As you can see, the larva look very similar 
to mealybugs. Um, I think this is a sort of um, evolutionary technique, you know, kind of a wolf in sheep's clothing. So the, the larvae are able to crawl around on the crops, eat the mealybugs, and hopefully not be disturbed too much by ants that may be protecting the mealybugs. And both the adults and the larvae are voracious mealybug eaters. Um, they, if, if you're trying to tell the difference between a uh, mealybug destroyer larva and a long, and a uh, mealybug, uh, the larva of a mealybug destroyer kind of looks like it's had a bad hair day. Like it has all these little like waxy filaments that are coming up off different angles off of its body. It also moves much more quickly around the plant. So you'll see it kind of crawling around looking for food. Whereas the mealybugs, you know, once they get past the crawler stage, they just kind of settle down on the leaf and start feeding and they don't move around too much on the plant. Also, if you flip this little larva over, you'll see a more defined head and head capsule, whereas mealybugs are just kind of a single body, single um, sort of blob. They don't have a defined head like a, like a mealybug destroyer larva would. And so I haven't talked too much about aphids yet. Lacewing and lacewing larvae are also known as aphid lions because lacewings also love aphids. They'll honestly, lacewing larvae are gentlest predators, so they'll eat just about anything they can get their little mandibles on. Um, but we don't use them too much for aphids because we uh, because we have uh, aphid parasitoids that work much better and are very effective at controlling our aphid population. So here's a video. It's, I will warn you, it's a little cheesy, but it is scientifically accurate. Here in the southeastern United States, these besieged plants have actually sent up a chemical mist and SOS to these black wasps. Why? Because black wasps are known as aphid killers. And some aphids are busily sucking the life out of these plants. Now, despite its nickname, this wasp isn't here merely to kill the aphids. No, that would be too easy. Like a character in a James Bond movie, the wasp has a more exquisite punishment for the aphid. <laughs> With a clinical precision, the wasp injects a single egg into each aphid's body. This means a slow death for the aphid as the wasp egg grows inside it. Each wasp can plant eggs in 200 aphids. The aphids send out their own chemical alarm systems and the colony panics. But it's too late. The wasp has done its work. Hasta la vista, baby. And we mean baby. Okay, so I want to pause this video here right now because this is something that you can look for on your plants when you have an aphid infestation. There are tons of naturally occurring aphid parasitoids in the landscape and they leave behind a signature aphid mummy. And so these are just kind of bloated looking aphids that are brown. Sometimes they'll be black and they are typically kind of stuck to the leaf surface and they're they're dead but they're bloated and round sometimes they're kind of shiny um, and they will have if the wasp has emerged from the mummy or pupa casing um, there will be a little hole at the back of the abdomen so this is something you can look for and if you're seeing these on your plants and you're seeing lots of mummies in addition to lots of aphids you could just let that aphid population ride and those wasps will likely control those aphids without you having to do anything. You just have a, you just have to have a little bit of a tolerance for the aphids for a little while. But anyways, back to the video. The aphids face a gruesome death. The ravenous wasp larva will eat the aphid alive from the inside out. The aphid's body becomes the incubator for the young of its predator. A new generation of assassins will soon emerge, littering these killing fields with corpses. 
Okay, now here's the money shot. The young wasp emerging to seek out more aphids to begin this cycle all over again. The wasp with its exquisitely deathly plan. And yet, just doing what nature's programmed it to do. All right. So, you now I was kind of touching on this a little bit previously, but I'm going to get into this a little bit more in depth when talking about predator and prey relationships. I love a good graph and you're lucky I haven't brought one into this presentation until now. And there's just this one, I promise. So try to bear with me while I explain this. So this graph shows the population of a soybean aphid and then a, a population of soybean aphids and then um, how that relates over time to a population of their parasitoids, aphelinus. So as you can see, the aphid population increases for some time before the parasitoids even show up, right? Like the population's already spiked, it's already gone uphill. But then once the parasitoids arrive, then the population of the aphids begins to decrease. And it decreases and decreases until it gets to this point. And the population of wasps is no longer supported by the population of aphids. So the wasp population also declines. And now you no longer really have aphids and you no longer really have wasps because there's no aphids for them to lay their eggs into. And uh, what this graph doesn't show is that this, these bell, bell curves will repeat themselves over and over again throughout a growing season. So, you know, the wasp decline. So if there's maybe one or two aphids left on the plant, then they may be able to make another population resurgence. But then the wasp will come back in and also control them yet again. And this is just nature in place, right? Like this is nature's way of population control. And so it, it's important to keep this sort of graph in mind when you're starting to see pests on your plants, because sometimes all you have to do is wait, wait for nature to come in, wait for the predators to come in and do their job and do what they're best at before you intervene. Right. And obviously there is some, you know, point at which it's too much and there need, you know, there needs to be some sort of intervention. But oftentimes in the landscape, if you're not doing a lot of insecticide applications, then, you know, the ecosystem will just kind of balance itself out. The ex exception to that is, say, if you do have an invasive species like the dreaded spotted, spotted lantern fly or great myrtle bark scale, Invasive species aren't, you know, the, the predators that are in our ecosystems haven't quite adapted to or figured out how to control the invasive species, which is why they've become invasive. Um, so, but this is more for your naturally occurring aphids and maybe white fly and thrips and things like that. And, you know, the, the predator and prey relationship will stay in balance unless there are other, you know, external inputs that may be affecting one of their populations, right? So say you're applying, okay, you see, you see some aphids on your kale plant, for example. And you know, you're like, okay, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait for the parasitoids, I'm not gonna do anything. But in the meantime, you go and spray, you know, your uh, marigolds for thrips. Well, that may impact the predators or parasitoids that would have controlled the aphids on your kale because a lot of adult forms, so like surfid flies, um, the adult surfid flies will feed on the pollen and nectar of various flowers in your yard or the adult uh, wasps, aphid wasps will feed on the pollen and nectar in your, in your yard. So it's important to keep in mind that, you know, so your, your yard, 
your backyard, your landscape is an ecosystem. So if you're affecting one part of it, there may be consequences that impacts another part. Or for example, you're applying um, insecticides to the soil. Some insecticides that are systemic can be presented in nectar and pollen. Um, or if you're fogging for, um, for mosquitoes in your backyard, most companies that fog for mosquitoes are using broad spectrum insecticides. So they're not just killing mosquitoes, they're killing everything that that pesticide is coming into contact with, including all of the flying beneficials that might be in your backyard as well. So it's really important to keep that in mind, you know, if you're wondering why you're having like really bad pest problems. Um, you want to think about what other things are happening in your yard or in your neighborhood and how that might be impacting um, beneficials or predators that are naturally occurring. So you, you might be thinking like, okay, does that mean that I can't apply any insecticides and I can't do anything to control any of the pests that I have? That's not necessarily true. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying be thoughtful about what it is that you're doing. Um, and so, you know, we at the garden, we've, we've started to become much more thoughtful about what we apply. And I don't know if these are bioinsecticides are as readily available currently to the public as they are in the private industry, but I do want to tell you about them because they're very exciting and very cool. Um, so two reduced risk insecticides that we use, and this is an EPA classification. A reduced risk insecticide is um, one that doesn't present a great risk to human health or the environment, and thus isn't as highly regulated as some that are, um, but they are still regulated by the EPA. They still have to have EPA registration numbers and everything. Um, they just, the EPA is determined based off of studies that they've done that these insecticides are really very safe to humans in the environment. So we use Isaria fumarosi, uh, which is in the cordyceps family, and Bouveria bassiana. So these are somewhat related to, um, I'm not gonna show the video right now because I feel like I've already showed a lot, shown a lot of videos, but if, you, if you've ever seen that Planet Earth episode of the ant crawling around and getting infected by a fungus and crawling up to the tip of a branch and then a big fungus grows out of its head and rain spores around on the, on the ants below it, and these are related to that, that, you know, they're, they're in the cordyceps family. And these are entomopathogenic fungi. So they kill, they grow on and infect and kill insects. And they now make commercial preparations of these that can be purchased and applied. But be, because it is a living organism, like these are spores that are being, um, you know, uh, applied in a greenhouse setting, uh, it requires, the products require refrigerated storage. And then once the products are mixed with water, it requires uh, warm temperatures and high humidity. And you have to apply that mixture within a certain amount of time. Like you can't let it sit for days on end um, in order for those spores to remain viable and be able to infect the insects. So there's some, you know, specific requirements for these insecticides to work. But we have um, those requirements, you know, it's very hot and humid in our greenhouses during the summer months. So these insecticides work pretty great in the summer months. Uh, so I took these pictures. These are um, of Bouveri bassiana, one of the insecticides, bioinsecticides that we use. Uh, and you can see little spores and these are just covered. So these are uh, mealybugs. And these are just covered in the mycelia and spores of the Bouveri bassiana. And these are dead, which is what we like to see. And so you may still be wondering, well, what can I do in my backyard? Well, there are uh, lots of other non-persistent insecticides that can be used. We use uh, quite a few of them at the Botanic Garden, um, such as insecticidal oil and insecticidal soap, as well as neem oil and acidiractin products. You can kill most soft-bodied pests if you apply insecticidal oil or insecticidal soap every seven days for four weeks. You don't want to apply more than once every seven days, and you don't want to apply if temperatures are above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, as it because in either of those scenarios, you might cause burning on your plants. 
Scales are a little more difficult and require more precise timing of the applications for when you're starting to see crawlers. And I'll show you a picture of a crawler on the next page. Um, and so obviously, you know, read labels. I'm, you know, providing this information, but it's not a recommendation. Um, and, you know, be very responsible and safe when you're applying these, you know, oils and soaps. They are contact insecticides, so they simply act by smothering or drying out the insect. So they will kill all insects that they come into contact with. If you spray a bee or if you spray one of your beneficials with it while they're out foraging on your plants, they're still going to die. It's just not, those insecticides aren't persistent in the environment. So once they dry, they aren't going to cause any harm. Like some of the more um, persistent chemical insecticides that are out on the market. And I will say we do occasionally use some systemic and persistent insecticides when we don't have any other options. We try to limit their use to um, in the conservatory, indoor spaces where they can't impact pollinators. But again, it's very important to read and follow the label because the label is the law. All right, last but not least, I wanted to share a fun little finding with you all. As I had mentioned, you know, we because so since we've been applying fewer systemic and persistent insecticides, we have started getting a lot of um, beneficials that we don't release in our conservatory and greenhouse spaces. So these are beneficials that are just coming in from outside, coming in through our vents, um, coming in through our doors and finding a happy place to live in our greenhouses and doing work that we don't wanna do, but they're very good at. So one of them is a uh, scale parasitoid. And these are not commercially available, so we can't buy them and, re and release them. But what they do is just like the aphid parasitoids, but instead they target um, a specific scale that we have. So they lay their egg. So here is it's either an egg or a very tiny larva right here, this little black spot um, in underneath the scale cover. Uh, that actually might be a fecal mass. I think this yellow part is the larva and this, this is the fecal mass of the scale larva. And so they grow just like the aphid parasitoids inside the scale. And then the scale eventually dies and becomes the pupa for the larva. And then the adult wasp exits out of the hole. And so up here in the top right corner, this is a scale crawler. As you can see, it's just, it looks like a little tiny scale, but it's got legs, it's moving around. So these, you're gonna need mag magnification if you're looking for these on your plants, get a 10X hand lens or a magnification visor, and that will really help you with scouting your plants. And that's the end of the presentation. Grace, did you have any, were there any questions in the chat? We definitely have some questions in the chat. Um, one folks, uh, one person is wondering, how do you prevent bringing spider mites inside um, on houseplants? Sure, I'm guessing that's maybe like after they put them outside for the summer or? Could be, yeah, okay. good guess. Or maybe coming from the, from the nursery or a garden store. Yeah, that's a great question. So, that um, touches upon another thing that, uh, one thing that I didn't talk about, but all of the plants that come into our conservatory and our greenhouses, everything that we buy in from the outside, I scout and I look for pests. And if I find pests, then we, um, we treat those pests. And so that's really important. If you're bringing in plants from outside, whether you're buying them in, or maybe you're just bringing them in, um, after they've been outside for the summer months, you want to scout your plants. Otherwise, you don't know whether or not there's going to there are pests on your plants and whether or not you need to treat your plants, right? So um, it's hard to prevent uh, bringing in pests uh, unless you scout your plants beforehand and know whether or not there's there's pests on your plants. Um, if you do find pests, then you know applying, insecticidal soap or oil every seven days for four weeks straight can really help, uh, especially with spider mites. You just need to make, make sure to get really good coverage. What else you got for me, Grace? 
Yeah, we've got a lot of folks just asking how to integrate um, beneficials into their home pest management. So do you have any just kind of pointers for folks who are looking to start? Um, probably sure. for, and is there a difference between indoor management in a home setting versus a, a garden management? Yeah, yeah. So, so garden management, you know, I, I, I kind of mentioned, you can just kind of let things ride and see if naturally occurring beneficials will do the, their job and uh, control pests that you might have. Um, but indoors, um, beneficials are a little more tricky because a lot of them don't particularly like um, air conditioned environments. You know, they want higher relative humidity. They want it a little bit warmer. But there are some species that can, um, you know, like the slow release sachets. Unfortunately, I'm not sure if you can buy them in smaller quantities. I've heard that there's some like online social media platforms where there are groups of people who all chip in to buy a big box of sachets and then they split them amongst each other. Um, but commercially, it's harder to find these sort of products for uh, the home user, but you can try searching online using the scientific name of that biological that you're trying to purchase. And you might be able to find them available in smaller quantities. You're probably going to be more able to find the mass release. So like the, the bottles of predatory mites or the bottles of insects um, that you could then release on your plants inside. Um, but yeah, it is, it is tricky in uh, interior environments. We've got one person wondering if we ever deal with squash borers and squash borer moths, um, and if we have sort of a, a management plan for those. We don't. We don't grow a ton of squash, um, and we haven't really had too much of an issue with them. I think, um, you can reach out or you can consult your uh, local um, extension office. So if you're in Maryland, it'd be the University of Maryland Extension or, um, you know, you see um, IPM, University of California, IPM has a great extension and great online resource as well as University of Florida Extension. Um, ex these extension um, are really great for specific questions like that, that might be kind of hyper local for where you are, um, or specific crops and things like that. And they may already have information on their websites pertaining to your region. A lot of pests that come through our areas, uh, particularly like any sort of flying insects, moths, scales, um, scales aren't flying, but um, insects in the landscape are often dependent upon the temperature and how many days um, they've been exposed to a certain temperature for them to have a certain life stage, right? Because insects are cold bodied. They are kind of just a series of chemical reactions. So the warmer that it is, the faster those chemical reactions are going to happen and therefore the faster their lifespan is going to occur. So a lot, so we have this thing in uh, plant health called uh, degree days. I think other industries also use it to measure like phenological data in terms of at what stage can we expect or at what degree day can we expect the moths to come and lay eggs on your squash plants, for example. And when that degree day occurs, there's usually um, some sort of alert that's on the extension website, or um, there's at least a calendar. And then also they will say like, okay, today we've reached so many degree days. And then you can refer to the calendar that they have in terms of what degree day you would expect the moths to lay eggs. And then you also know, you can find out like, okay, 10, you know, five days from that, the eggs will hatch. And that's when I should apply um, a BT product or a spinosad product to then kill those caterpillars before they bore into your squash. 
Sorry, that was a very long-winded explanation. Hopefully it was helpful. <laughs> that was super helpful. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Sure. Someone is struggling with white flies. Um, do you have any advice for getting rid of them or preventing them? Uh, sure, yeah. So white flies, uh, they, depending on the species of white fly, they do uh, make they do they do mass produce uh, two different white fly parasitoids that can be commercially purchased, and those uh, could be released in your crop or your house plants potentially if they are um, the right type of white fly. There's um, some good online guides uh, for white fly identification if you have magnification. Like I said, you know, a 10x or 15x is really important for um, scouting and identification of pests. Um, if you don't have any of that and you don't wanna buy parasitoids, again, just soap or oil once every seven days for four weeks, make get really good coverage, especially since they're gonna be on the, on the undersides of your leaves um, and that should help. Thank you so much, Chelsea. And I want to add that we've added um, the USBG plant hotline into the chat, as well as some um, resources that Chelsea has recommended for um, all of our attendees today. And I just want to thank you, Chelsea, so much for a fabulous lecture and thank everyone for attending today. All right. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Thank for coming. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thanks so much.